At first, it didn't seem like winter. New England was enjoying a mild December, and California was still baking in a two-year drought. Instead of snow, it began with wind and fire. The hot desert winds came blasting in, pelting everything with clouds of blowing dirt, causing six deaths, overturning trucks and trailers, and starting fires. At Vandenberg Air Force Base, testing site for our missiles and the space shuttle launcher, 400 men fight through the night to contain a raging brush fire that blackened 10,000 acres. And when the night is over, the bodies of the base commander and two civilian fire officials are found on one of the launch complexes where they'd been trapped by the fire. December passes, the new year opens, and then they begin, the winter storms. A January storm hits Long Island near New York, knocking down power lines, trapping people in unheated homes for nearly five days. Emergency utility crews come in from as far as Detroit and Chicago. So does the army, sent in by the president to help out. In California, the drought has broken with a bang. In the east, the first big snowstorm of 78. It dusts Washington lightly, but drops 13 inches on Philadelphia, leaves the New Jersey Turnpike strewn with trucks and cars. For New York, it's 18 inches, the heaviest snowfall in nine years. And in Boston, it sets a local record, 21 inches in 24 hours. In Oswego, New York, they've had 16 feet of snow since winter began. And the cars are flying flags so others can see them coming around the towering snowbanks. Oswego is used to it. The South is not. Nashville is trying to plow out. And in Louisville, cars are clanking along on glare ice one week, buried in snow the next. In Dallas and Fort Worth, there's ice on the Spanish bayonet, snowmen on the lawns, and no snow plowing equipment to meet an unexpected storm. On the Great Northern Plains, another blizzard is on its way. It sweeps through Chicago with 80 mile gusts, moves over Michigan, Ohio, Indiana, knocking down power lines, freezing traffic wherever it goes. Ain't no plows running out here. West of Indianapolis, an Amtrak train is stalled in snow drifts for more than 12 hours before rescue teams can reach it. In many places, helicopters become the only way to move food and fuel, lift emergency medical patients to hospitals. Everywhere, the headlines spell bad news. The worst winter anyone can remember. The coal miners' strike is nearing its 50th day, Heat has to be turned down. Electricity cut back 25%. January has become an unending nightmare of spinning wheels, skidding cars, snow and ice. Meanwhile, in sunny California, it's been raining for a month. Ordinarily, the Los Angeles River is a dry concrete trench. Now, There's been a cloudburst in the Hollywood Hills. The rain started coming down really hard. I looked out my balcony window, and I saw my car floating down the street. The sliding glass door, there's a big bay window back there, and all of that mud and that 40-foot that tree, the whole thing, I was buried alive, and I don't have a scratch on me. Thank you, Lord. Streets are turned into rivers, houses buried under avalanches of mud. Get out of there. Mud, mud right up to the doorknobs. Civil Defense enlists hundreds of young volunteers to help shovel it out. At Hidden Springs, a resort area north of Los Angeles, 28 people are missing, and searchers on horseback are looking for bodies.
14 California counties are suffering heavy flood damage. And almost 31,000 families will receive assistance through federal centers set up under the President's Disaster Relief Fund. For many, the losses are catastrophic. When the mudslide smashed into his house, Bob Kaufman felt fortunate he'd managed to save his paralyzed wife. But now... I called the insurance company and said, so sorry, to everything's excluded. You have no coverage whatsoever, so here's over $100,000. And we're, we're just about wiped out. I don't know what I'll do. I just don't know what I'll do. But it's only the beginning. And the rains will continue. Back east, another storm is brewing. It comes blowing north through Washington, on to Philadelphia and Trenton. It hits New York full force, much harder than the storm just two weeks before. All along the east coast, the last planes are taking off, trying to beat the storm. In Boston, the National Weather Service begins broadcasting warnings for all of southern New England. It looks like a real bomb. We've got a ship report here of 50 knots. Massachusetts Civil Defense. This is the National Weather Service of Boston. Heavy snow warnings for Massachusetts this afternoon and tonight. At Framingham, Massachusetts, the, the state's emergency operating center has already gone on full alert. Considerable drifting and blizzard conditions at times. An accumulation of 8 to 16 inches will fall before the storm abates, making homeward bound commuting very difficult. By early afternoon, the storm is sweeping into New England. Businesses begin letting their people out early, but not early enough. Thousands will never make it home. We're waiting, waiting for ruckus for like two hours now. Do you believe it? Yeah, no, sir, I've got about 10 streets to plow. Civil defense, may I help you? What about this truck in Rhode Island's emergency operating center, problems are piling up as fast as the snow. Sandy, this is Governor Harry. He wants to talk to you. Yes, Governor. Rocco, the governor's called down and is asking for an estimate of the stranded vehicles on Interstate 95. What have you got up to date? Over 3,000. That's quite a jump, about 200 from the last count. Many drivers trapped in the snow will die in their cars tonight. Just don't go. Stay where you are. Stay home. Nightfall, and the snow keeps falling. New York streets are nearly deserted, and along Broadway, Hit shows suddenly are playing to empty houses. There is no railroad service out of Pitt Station. People are holding up in railroad stations, offices, hotels, bedding down on floors and cots, finding shelter wherever they can. What do you think of this terrible snowstorm we're having here? I, uh, I'm jammed here for the rest of the duration. In Hartford, the police are collecting lost kids. So it was too cold and I couldn't go walking. So you stopped a policeman and asked for help? A little a man told bring me here. I'd like to have him down here. Yeah, yes, I'm yes, I'm thankful to you. Thank you very much. But it's got a happy ending. Yeah, I'd be happy now. Hartford police, missing persons. There are missing husbands, too. And Kathy Canton of Portsmouth has Hello. one of them. Hi, you'll never believe where I am. Oh my God, where are you? I have been so worried. One worry is over, but now a new one begins. From the looks of it, it's going to be real bad, real bad. Oh, and that's my main concern, because I have to get up to Boston Friday because of Michael. Oh, no, no, he's right here. Young Michael Canton suffers a rare disease, agammaglobulin anemia, complicated by recurrent pancytopenia, requiring regular transfusions of both red cells and platelets. And the only place with the special irradiator needed is Children's Hospital in Boston, 60 snowbound miles away. How are we going to be able to get him up there? 
Well, from all forecasts, it's just going to keep going, and they're just locked in solid. There's traffic jams all over the place, and I don't think anything's going to be moving. In Boston, literally a winter hurricane. The winds are still gusting at about 45 or 48 miles an hour. The winds at this point are critical, particularly to shore areas uh, where they have another high tide coming at about 11 o'clock this evening. Seas there are 20 to 30 feet in height. Winds are over 60 miles an hour. Revere Fire Department, Monica. At Revere, a few miles north of Boston, the town's emergency operating center is located in the firehouse and the mayor and his aides are fighting mounting problems. Archie, you've got evacuations Dolphin Avenue as soon as possible. Attention engine three and ladder one. Respond to 45 Dolphin Avenue. Okay, engine three, engine three, responding to 45 Dolphin Avenue. Send us over to operations. We didn't have them uh, check it out. We get the NDC sending their duck daisy over to Revere. EDA is 0200 hours. Governor, I think the thing that we should be stressing right now is that we've got to have the cooperation with the travel ban. We've got to keep the people... Robert Cunningham, the Massachusetts the Civil Defense Director. We've got about 3,000 things we've got to move there. In Providence, the Rhode Island Director, Sandy Amato, is facing the same sort of troubles. That truck has got to come out of that area that we've got loads of oxygen on there. We've got yeah. four hospitals that are looking for okay. We've got to get it in here right away. Sandy, Joe Cotabali is making Rhode Island, Connecticut, and Massachusetts now are almost totally paralyzed by the blizzard. And a complete travel ban is ordered by all three governors. J. Joseph Garrahy of Rhode Island. Travel bans in effect in local communities must be observed. Schools, businesses, industries. Ella Grasso of Connecticut. For emergency purposes will be closed and in the morning an assessment will be made. Ladies and gentlemen, the weather situation that now exists in the Commonwealth is one of the worst in our history. And for that reason, I've ordered a state of emergency. Michael Dukakis of Massachusetts. Of the acts of 1950. As emphatically as I can possibly say it, all people are to remain in their homes. All night long, the Atlantic waves will keep battering at the shore. In Salem Sound, two ships are in trouble and a pilot boat sent to the rescue is going down with all hands on board. Morning, along the Jersey shore, a bathhouse lies wrecked. A fishing vessel driven ashore. In Massachusetts, what we saw is awesome. And I can't begin to describe the, the devastation that has been wrought by this storm on our coastal communities, one sees Houses washed into the sea, one sees homes tipping into the ocean. In Revere, firemen are pulling more people out of the water. Already, nearly 10,000 have been evacuated from Winthrop, Situate, Hall. Providence lies buried under 28 inches of snow, and it's still falling in much of New England. Here in Boston, the storm of three weeks ago broke the record for the most snow ever in a 24-hour period. It was 21 inches. Now today, we've had 24 inches in 24 hours. Simply incredible. The three governors are forced to call for help. Uh, this morning, we sent to the president a request for the declaration of a state of emergency. 
I have also written to the President to notify him of our interest in applying for a presidential declaration of a major disaster for Rhode Island. Again, let me repeat, this is a very serious emergency situation, and all people are to remain in their homes. In response, the President promises aid and snow removal equipment. But airport runways will have to be cleared before the heavy cargo planes can land. The 911 emergency number, of course, is... Four. In the Massachusetts Emergency Center. The emergency civil defense number is 237. We've got a, a huge backup there. We've got to get an, uh, some front-end loaders in, move the snow out before we can even open up any access roads. Mr. Commissioner Jordan wants uh, MPs to, because he expects looting. Oh, We're having a lot of calls of kidney dialysis machines. Make sure you alert the medical helicopter ambulance company to be on standby. As soon as this weather clears, they're going to get quite a few missions. In Rhode Island, the Cantons are still snowed in. No, in fact, Dr. Wallace even commented that he would try to hire a private plane if he had to. She got short. Oh, Lord, yeah, Dick's terribly worried, and he's stuck up there, and there's nothing he can do. He's just, you know, chewing his nails. People are getting about as best they can, by sled, snowmobile, snowshoe, or ski. On the Connecticut shore, they're waiting. There's about 18 inches of water down there. And in Hartford, they're still shoveling. 28 degrees, that's minus 2 Celsius. Snow continues to fall in this time. Day three, sunshine at last, and the people pour out to celebrate. I hope that the fact that the sun is shining and the blue skies are out there doesn't deceive anybody. We have a very serious emergency situation. I know that some of you are suffering from cabin fever or are getting a little stir crazy. That's about the only thing I can suggest is that you go out and take a walk or shovel some more snow if you haven't had enough of that. way of getting out. Shovel it out. Yeah, uh, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> it was a bad night, really. The traffic was awful bad. Yeah. But in spite of that, you managed to have a good time? Yeah, sure. We got to live. I just want to find some money and uh, get to a clothing store so I can change my clothes. I feel terrific because Thursday morning at 8.36, I'm going to be on a flight to Orlando with my kids to Disney World. We play cards most of the night. Um, went bowling. And if my boss is looking, I did a little work. <laughs> Come on. Well, okay. I play cards and went bowling all night. In Providence, they're facing the world's worst traffic jam. Sure, the storm is over, and today was a bright, sunny day. But the roads are still in terrible condition. People are still getting stuck. And the plows, as a result, are having a hard time returning things to normal. Serious problems. Serious problems. There must be four or 5,000 people walking around. Cars, trucks all over the place. It's unbelievable. And I'll tell you, we've all had it. I'm, I'm down on pills now. I'm high, got high blood pressure. We're down on pills. Nobody's around here. People's got their cars all locked up. They won't even get down here to help us open them up so we can get out. It's, it's unbelievable. The tangle of cars makes snow removal an impossible job. And it's had other costs. A hundred New Englanders have died in the blizzard. Nearly half in their cars, trying to drive through the storm in spite of warnings. Medical evacuation cases are creating another traffic jam. Now look, you stay right there. We're going to try and get a snowmobile on a chopper to you just as soon as we possibly can. With fair skies, the rescue helicopters can fly at last. Both the Rhode Island and Massachusetts National Guards begin flying hundreds of mercy missions, airlifting in food and fuel, evacuating emergency cases. And now the airport runways can be cleared. Yes, Commissioner. We need to divert as many of your wing blade snow plows from the mass turnpike as you can possibly spare to go into Logan Airport to clear the runways. Yes, we expect the Air Force to be in in four hours with heavy snow fighting equipment and personnel on board. Day four. Along the Massachusetts shore, Concrete seawalls have been tossed about like children's blocks. One man escaped the high waves only by crawling up into his attic. It seemed like everything was going to collapse, but it didn't. I mean, it, parts of it picked up, but uh, it's still standing. Why are you still here? <laughs> Where can we go? I mean, uh, part of somebody else, I mean, we're still uh, surviving. It's okay. 
the federal government has opened one-stop disaster assistance centers to bring aid in many forms to the thousands of victims. Home, farm, and small business loans, food stamps, shelter, crisis counseling, trailers, and other emergency housing. Okay, could you give me directions how to get to the house after you are in situation? Go down and look for all the wreckage when you're there. Connecticut has managed to clear its major roads. Massachusetts is gaining, but Rhode Island's caught it worst of all. The snowfall there has reached 54 inches in some spots, and the situation still desperate. I am standing on Route 195, but on the Massachusetts side of the state line. As you can see behind me, that's Rhode Island. And it doesn't take much to tell where the state line is, right where the bare pavement ends, and the snow begins. For young Michael Kenton, time's running out. Well, they did a level on him. There's no doubt about it. I've got to go up Friday, but I don't know how I'm going to go. Well, I can't drive. There's no way. First down on my foot. Well, it's got to be Boston. It's the only place around that can do it. Yes. The whole face. All I can do is wait. Yeah, I mean, there's no sense in getting too, too up upset. Something's got to happen. Nine yards. Yeah. Somehow, some way, it'll work because it has to. You're not gonna make it. Okay. <laughs> At last, a call from the governor's office. I just wanted to know one thing. Is this an emergency? Yes. Would you classify it as a matter of life and death? Yes, I would. All right, then hang up, and you'll be contacted by someone from the National Guard. All right, thank you. Whoa! 50 yards. Next, to General Leonard Holland, National Guard. All right, Governor, we will have a helicopter on its way to Newport to pick up the Canton boy. In the ready room at Quonset yeah, Point. Okay, Carl. Yeah. Yes. Newport to Boston. I'll give you further instructions in the air. Jack Frank, get a minute back. At dawn on Friday, Captains Toll, Keenan, and their crew come in for a landing at Newport to pick up Kathy Canton. Michael, and a friend, Noreen Schrake, who's volunteered to be the second blood donor needed for Michael's transfusions. Blood Donor Center at Children's Hospital. Pick us up at Newport Airport. And we landed in Fenway Park and there wasn't even a ball game. <laughs> okay. Sweetie. How long will it take? Pump the blood out, extract the platelets, put the blood back in, and start over again. Repeat the process four times. Both Kathy Canton and Mrs. Shrake will be on the blood donor's couches for eight long hours before there'll be enough red cells and platelets for Michael, waiting in the emergency room downstairs. Okay, Mike, you ready? One, two, three. Okay. It's 9.30 at night before the weary business is finished, and Michael is free to go home. Michael, how did you like your helicopter ride? I liked it. It was the first one I was on in my life. What did you like about it? Tell me about it. I kind of like being in the air. It looks neat. For Michael, the crisis is over, but not for others, like Governor Gerrahi. We're making a, uh, a particular effort tonight to ensure that fuel is moved throughout the state of Rhode Island. Governor, where is this going to be all over? <laughs> others feel the same way. What do you think of all that? Oh, I don't know. I hate snow. I hate it. <laughs> all this snow, it's a lot of trouble. Oh, I enjoy it. I think it's great. It's like, it's winter. That's the way it's supposed to be in New England. We, we should have a reasonable amount of snow, but not too much to prevent us from going about our daily chores. Have we got too much now? Uh, I, I'm afraid that the Lord has given us much too much. Even spring won't put an end to disaster. There'll be another ice storm in Illinois. I'd say right now, uh, probably uh, 250, 300,000 people that are totally without power. In Chicago, skyscrapers shedding ice and people ducking for cover. Look out, pal. It's coming down heavy. 
In California, the rains will continue, and the drought information centers will be renamed flood information centers. In Phoenix, houses will be floating away in the Arizona desert, and there'll be more flooding in Kentucky, West Virginia, New Orleans. Winter, it happens every year, not always like this. But one sure thing is, come winter, disaster will strike in many places, many ways. People will suffer, and some will die, because they didn't take the needed precautions for winter survival, didn't lay in emergency supplies, or insisted on driving instead of listening. Just don't go. Stay where you are, stay home. They make it ASAP on the, the year was full of heroic rescue and recovery efforts by thousands of state and local emergency workers, both volunteer and professional. Before 1978 was out, the president would declare 39 major disasters and emergencies. The federal government would contribute nearly three quarters of a billion dollars to emergency management and recovery. And nearly 90,000 families would qualify for federal disaster assistance. Recovery will be slow. For months, they'll be rebuilding homes, dams, bridges, seawalls. And the bulldozers still will be scraping up the tons of clamshells tossed up by the winter storm. It was a year of blizzard and fire, of flood and mud, misery, hardship, death. The winter that came in like a lamb, but went roaring out like a lion. 